All right, guys. So today's video is how to build a fence meter 10 easy as DIY. It's by meter 10 New Zealand. So I was pretty excited when Jeremy said he found a, a positive video for me to review uh, from New Zealand. We actually have a little bit of a following down in like the Australia and New Zealand area. So I'm interested to see how they build fence and how it compares to how we build fence here in the States. Building a fence is the easiest way to give your property some extra safety, security. All right, first and foremost, I'm digging his colors. I like this a lot. Obviously, we're a big fan of orange here at uh, the Fence Expert channel, so I like that Miter 10 is also a big fan of orange. And privacy from the road or from your neighbors. Everyone will see it too, so it's a good reason to make sure it's built well and looks good. The fence we're building here is a simple post rail and paling fence. Follow these instructions and with a Interesting to note, pickets are called palings. Good plan, you'll be able to do it yourself. Now, there's a few things you need to be aware of before you get it. And this might be a regional thing, but you notice that all of the pickets are flat across the top. They're all straight. Uh, so here in our region in the Midwest, everyone uses a dog-eared board. So the corner of each picket would be cut off. Give it a little bit more of a finished look, uh, but... I kind of like the straight top look as well. So probably my guess, I haven't watched this yet, but my guess is so they build it and then they cut the top portion of it off because these these pickets look incredibly smooth across the top uh, from picket to picket. Firstly, you can build a fence up to 2.5 metres high without a building permit, but it's always best to check with you. I have to do math. I'm not sure uh, how many feet 2.5 metres is, but it looks like just judging from its height, maybe it's a five foot tall fence the council before starting and if you're building on a boundary line you're best to talk to your neighbor about what sort of fence you're building its costs and your start time also download a copy of the fencing act to make sure you're in the know so that's interesting so um again you talk to your neighbors absolutely make sure you know where your boundary lines are 100 percent uh he had said download the boundary act so i wonder if uh in new zealand if there's a you know countrywide um Sounds like there's a country ride regulation for fencing, um, or at least for fencing in relation to boundaries. So in the States, you'd want to check with your local, you know, your local either municipality, city, et cetera, and check on local zoning laws. Next, you'll need to establish your boundary. If you can't find your boundary pegs, get a copy of your plans from the council or get a surveyor in to help you out. So here in the States, you would, uh, he had referenced uh, reaching out to your council and here in the States, it'd be your uh, local at your county assessor's office. It's important to check your council plans to see where all your pipes are located. You certainly don't want to hit any of those. And also you'll need to call your electricity provider for info on underground wires because these may not be shown on your plan. Here in the States, you'd actually just dial 811. Uh, so there's a there's a nationwide network of locate, uh, utility locators. Uh, it's free of charge. They'll mark all the public utilities. And the way I like to differentiate or explain public versus private is public utilities are typically anything with a meter. Now, this doesn't apply to, to media. So it's anything with a demarcation box as well as when we're talking about phone and internet. But if we're talking about electricity, water, sewer, gas, if it has a meter on it, it's public. Now, the important thing to note with public utilities when they mark them, they only mark them to the meter. That's a demarcation point from public to private. Uh, so if you have a meter up to the road, and spe specifically like for water, they'll typically only mark to the meter. Uh, sometimes they'll mark to the house, but typically it's public to the meter, private after the meter. Okay, so now it's time to decide what your fence is going to look like and what materials you're going to use to build it. In our situation, we're just going to match the existing fence with a rough sawn post, 4 by 2 rails, and rough sawn fence palings. You can also get dressed or glue laminate posts and a variety of paint finish palings in different sizes. So now you can measure up, draw yourself a plant and get your materials ordered. That's interesting. So it looks like uh, they call it a coated or a painted picket. So here in the States, it'd be more common to see, um, you know, your wood would be either a pressure treated pine, a cedar, possibly a redwood if you lived out in the West Coast. Um, but pre-stain is kind of the the upgraded option of the wood. Okay, the site's been cleared, so I've got a nice clean canvas to work with. The first thing I have to do is establish exactly where my boundary is so I can put up my string line. Okay, I've got my string line up. Now, not only does this represent 
exactly where my boundary line is. It also represents the centre of my post holes. Normally when I build a fence, I put my posts at no more than two metres apart. You can go up to 2.4. In this situation, I've measured out and two metres is exactly where the existing fence was and I can see there's still concrete in the hole. I don't want to dig all that concrete out, so what I'm going to do is actually space my posts a little bit closer together. All right, I'm going to Google this real quick. Uh, two meters to see, because he's talking about uh, two meter spacing between posts. So I should probably know something like this, but, you know, we use feet rather than meters. Two meters in feet is going to be 6.7, six feet, and then six point seven, six and a half feet, 6.674. Six feet, 6.74 inches. Um, so it sounds like his posts are six foot apart, which is a, an incredibly sturdy post. Um, is that right? So, Because he also mentioned that the that the fence was two and a half meters tall. That fence certainly didn't look taller than him. Uh, two and a half meters. Well, maybe he was just talking about the local regulations. So two and a half meters is eight feet, two and a half inches. Uh, it certainly didn't look like an eight-foot fence. But I like the fact that their posts are six foot apart. So here in the States, the standard is eight foot or less per post. Of course, the closer your posts are together, the stronger the fence. Space my posts a little bit closer together. At the moment, I've got five posts. I'm going to put one extra post in. So that's going to give me six posts, which will mean I can get away from all that existing concrete. So that's a good point, too. So it looks like he had taken out an existing fence. Uh, he said there's concrete still on the ground, so they probably cut the posts off just below grade which is completely common, uh, but he offset the post so that he's avoiding those concrete slugs that are still left in the ground. Using my tape measure and dazzle, I'll measure and mark the center of each post along the boundary line. Then I'm ready to dig my holes. So one note on the color of paint here in the States. So as I said before, we've got utility locators. They'll come out and they'll mark all the utilities. Now each utility has its own color code, depending on what type of utility it is. Uh, so here in the States, if you're going to mark, you need to mark with white paint. White paint is designated as uh, proposed excavation. If you use a different color, it could be confused as a utility line. Which need to be a minimum of 250 millimeters in diameter and 600 millimeters deep. You can use a spade to dig them by hand, but I've hired a post hole borer to make the job nice and easy. So I measure and mark the required depth on the auger so I know when to stop. That's a nice tip too. So he marked the auger at his at his uh, needed depth, uh, however deep he needs this hole to be, um, so that when he sees that mark at grade level, he just knows it's at the correct depth. It's a it's a hack that we use, so it keeps you from having to measure to pull out the auger to measure, pull out the auger to measure, mark the auger with some bright paint. In this case, he used pink, and you'll know exactly when you're at depth. I'm using a two person post hole borer, so I've got a maiden to help. And make sure to clean the hole out before you drop your posts in. Okay, all my post holes are dug. They're looking great. I'm just about ready to throw my posts in, ready for concrete. Now, I've moved our string line, which was the center of our post holes. I've moved that over 100 millimeters. I got to 100 because our post is 100 mil thick, so I'm coming half that, which is 50. And I'm just gonna keep our string line 50 millimeters off our post. The reason for that is, most of the time these rough sawn posts have a few dags on them and that could affect our string line if the string line was to be hard up against it. I've also put a string line at the top that's 100 millimeters away from I like that he's doing this too, a string line at top and bottom. Um, so what that's going to do is help make sure each and every post is plumb as long as it is, so in his case, 50 millimeters from the bottom and the top string, he knows that this post is plumb with the rest of the post and with the other fence. Now, I've got two different fence heights. I've got one here that I'm starting from and one down the other end that's 200 millimetres higher. So I've set the string line up using my laser to shoot a nice straight line and I'll keep my post full length, then cut them to height down the track. Now, I'm just about ready to put my posts in. I've got a bit of concrete in the bottom for my post to sit on because we don't want our posts touching the ground. Now, I've also got myself an off cut so that's interesting. Uh, it sounded like he had said that he puts a, a piece of concrete in the bottom of the hole uh, to keep the post from touching the ground when the concrete surrounds it. It's an inter interesting tip. Cut a 4 by 2 here, which is 50 mil thick, so I'm going to use that in between the post and the string line just to use as a rule. And I've also got 
a couple of braces here with screws already in the end, ready for me to screw into my pegs that I've already plonked in the ground. Because I'm working on my own, I just have to get myself set up to make it easy. So what I'm gonna do, put my brace up against my peg, and just gotta make sure that I'm 50 mil away, which is the thickness of our block. That's pretty good down there. So that's interesting that he's using what he calls pegs, just anchor points uh, there in the ground to keep this post up, this post plumb in both directions while it sets up. Uh, typically, you know, as a, as a fencing contractor, we use two or three guys. Uh, so one's holding the post plumb while the other one pours concrete. But if you're doing it yourself and you only have yourself, you know, you don't have any helpers to come out and lend a hand. This is absolutely a, uh, a nice method. You guys probably saw this when we did the second post foam a setting video, this is how I braced it up, braced the posts up to where they stayed perfectly plumb while the foam expanded. And that's about five mil away, so it says I just need to tweak that bottom over a tad. And we'll come back, check that. Okay, so that's looking good. So what we'll do is put a screw in our brace. And we'll put one down here. I'm just going to pick up my brace and put that on the other side of the peg. I'll do a quick check for plumb and secure the second brace at the top and the bottom. Okay, that's looking great. So what I'm going to do now is set up my next post, use the same peg, come back onto that. Process is exactly the same. And that's all my posts braced, ready for concrete. I've mixed up all my concrete as per the instructions on the back of my bag. All I have to do, plonk that in the hole. About so this this is uh, this is one of those half half dozen one six of another. So he's using wet set, um, which means he pre mixes it. The concrete's wet before it goes in the hole. Uh, there's a lot of guys out there that prefer dry set or a compression method. Uh, yeah, interesting to see that they do it down in New Zealand. I almost wonder if they have the same debates down there uh, on as to wet set versus dry set. About 100 millimeters from the top, work out any bubbles and let it sit for 24 hours. Okay, it's been 24 hours, the concrete's nice and set, the posts are looking good. Next thing I have to do is take our braces off. Rightio, so I'm just about ready to start marking out my fence post for where my rails are situated. I'm just gonna match in with my existing fence here. We're 50 millimetres down from my string line here, which indicates the top of my paling. Now, normally you could go a maximum of 150 millimetres from your top of your rail to the top of your paling. So we're just gonna copy in here what's here, 50 mil down, so we're gonna keep that line all the way through. So on my first new post, I'll mark 50 millimetres down from the string line, do the same on my last post, and then run a chalk line between the two, indicating the top of my first set of rails. And to match the existing, I'll do the same for the middle rails. I like that he's using a chalk line, so that's an interesting tip there. Uh, usually you'd see, you'd see fence guys just measure each post, either before they came off the truck or after they're set, they would measure each one and make marks. Uh, using a chalk line does a couple of things. One, it's more efficient, so you're marking several posts at the same time. But two, you're making sure that each one stays in line with the next. So it, your measurements don't get off versus, you know, if you're measuring, typically you measure off of grade. In this instance, you know, these, these rails are going to be straight across the entire fence. Now for my bottom rail, ultimately I'd like to match up with what's existing, but I can't do that because my ground level here is slightly higher than over there. So what I'm going to do is just take our ground level and come up 50 millimetres, and that measurement there will be the bottom of our rail. If I wasn't working in with an existing fence, I would mark the top of my top rail 150 millimetres down from the top of the fence, the bottom of my bottom rail 150 millimetres up from the ground, and then split the difference for the middle rail. So that's the bottom of my bottom rail marked on all my posts. Now there's a couple of different ways we can fix our fence rails. One is to the face like that, spanning over three posts. Or what we're gonna do is take our fence rails and fix it in between our posts. Now, when you start measuring out for your rails in between the posts, take the measurement at the bottom and use that for all three rails. 
I'm interested to see this. So the rails are actually going to be affixed in between the posts, um, which is how we install it for Postmaster posts. It's, it's how you have to install it using Postmaster. But on wood, we typically face mount or surface mount the rails um, simply because you have more surface area to run your fasteners through the two-by material into the post. Um, with, I'd be interested to see how he, how he attaches it. So typically guys that run rails in between posts end up what we call toe nailing or running a screw through the corner of the two by into the post. I'm not completely sold that that's the best fastening method uh, for these rails. I've already squared my mark around. I've got a nail sitting on there that's going to help me out. So I'll just sit that in there nice and flush with the front. Now, you could use four inch nails or 90 mil galvanized nails to fix that to the post. What I like to use are these 100 mil galvanized bugle screws. Reason for that is, it's gonna reduce any twisting or warping of our posts and our rails, and it's just gonna hold everything together nice and strong. Now, if you are working in a high wind zone, I'd recommend you use something like a 100 mil by 10 mil coach screw. That'll fix it in nice and strong as well. And it's best practice to use three screws per rail on each end. Yeah, so he's using more screws than what we see commonly here in the States when we're seeing guys that, that toenail in uh, screws or nails. The problem is up at the corner, there's not a lot of wood. There's not a lot of uh, just st structure of the two-by material attaching it. I'd be worried about that cracking out long term. Um, but, I mean, to each their own, right? There's always more than one way to build a fence. For our top rail, what I will use is my strop to make sure I tight those two posts in really nice and tight. My fence rails are up, they're looking fantastic. Now when we put our palings to our rails, we want to keep them off the ground about 20 odd mils, so I've just laid a board down there and we're just going to drop our paling on top of that. Now I've left my line on here, that's always been our level line, and our boards are going to stick above it because we're not staying to this height, we're staying to our height on the other end of the fence, which is 200 millimetres down. So I'm going to use the string line to get a nice straight line later, and then come back, cut those off. I was, I was wondering how he was going to do that. That makes more sense is to cut everything after you get the pickets up. Makes a nice finished look. And then cut our posts off. Because I'm using a 25 millimeter thick fencing paling, I'm gonna use my 65 mil galvanized fencing nail to fix these. And I'm gonna be using my nail gun to, to apply the nail through. Now, obviously you can use a hammer and a nail to do this. A couple more little tips before you crack into it. When we put our boards up, we're gonna use our hammer and chisel, get it nice and tight. Because nine times out of 10, these boards have got a lot of moisture in them. When the sun hits them and dries them out, more than likely you'll get a little gap. So we'll try and avoid that. And then fix them with two nails per paling on each rail. And about every six or seven boards, we're gonna throw our trusty level on there just to make sure we're staying plumb the whole way. Another wee tip is to use a spirit level to give yourself a straight line for your nails to follow. A few rails from the end that's a nice touch, using the level to make sure all your nails are nice and straight. And measure the remaining space as you may very well need to rip your final paling down to fit. Simply measure and mark each end, rule a line along and cut it down using your circular saw. Then fix it in place and that's all our paling's on. I've flicked a chalk line on the wall here for me to cut the top of my palings off. Now I'm just going to use my trusty circular saw to do that. It's going to set that just the depth of the palings. And you could put a board underneath here if you don't trust yourself with a nice straight free hand. But however, I'm just going to freehand that and give myself a nice straight line. Then finally cut the posts off at an angle so the water runs off. It's a nice touch too, cutting the post at an angle. To his point, the water runs off and water doesn't set and settle on the top of the post, uh, which could cause premature rot. So there's our new fence. Just stick to the plan and it'll be easy as. Well, guys, another great video. I think uh, Meter 10 or Miter 10 uh, did a great job. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. I'm always, I'm always interested to see how others build fence in other markets, much less halfway across the world. 
Well, guys, for now, I'm Joe Everest, the fence expert, reminding you that good neighbors make good fences. Nope. Good fences make good neighbors. Maybe we just leave that in there. Let's do that. Let's leave it in and see if anyone catches it. Ha, ha, ha.